images that could be strong enough to hold up unto themselves. They were made with the intent of being a part of this one installation. And they all lead back here. Even if they were not included, they inform the others. Oh, yeah, bust it out. Oh, my God, your baby's so cute. Um, yes, it changes, and actually, it's um, I, there's no there's no ability to recreate it. It's done, and that's the end of it. I mean, there's way to reference um, what had happened and the w the way that the piece was installed, but there's no way to replicate it or sh shift it. It's it's over, um, and I'm working on a retrospective now that'll have a book and it'll have a lot of these components in it, but it's very much about the project and not the project. So it includes these photographs, there's details of it, and they'll be printed in manners that's fitting a museum. Um, but again, even though that they, they will be presented as something that will be tangible in terms of access to museum goers, it's the idea of the piece that's the piece and not these particular objects themselves. So thank you very much for asking me that question. Oh, I can go for I can go either way. You can go questions, can sit down, just someone tell me what to do and I'm good with it. Yeah, I can go with it now and then I can't wait. Um, you can collect one of the details of it. All of the prints um, from 2000 to 2010 were unedition with the exception of some prints that I made that were additioned yearly. So I would make X number of prints per year, and that would be the amount I'd make per year. But now that the installation is done, those prints are it. That's, that's it. Um, like, what's done within that time period is in itself an addition, because it's very specific to the time period in which the project is going on. And so museums have prints that I've made that are in addition, um, or site-specific installations that I've made for specific places, museums, and um, also in my gallery. So there's different ways that it, it's kind of bandied about. Um, but again, it's just, part, it's just part of a bigger project that's not accessible in terms of purchase. So it's, it's posed a lot of difficulty in terms of my own financial stability in relation to um, the photography market. OK, great. Get ready for asking me questions later when it's panel time. Zoe, that's great. <laughs> um, our next panelist is Michael Foley, who is the owner and director of Foley Gallery in New York, which specializes in the representation of contemporary artists who work with photography, painting, sculpture, and works on paper. Foley opened his gallery in the fall of 2004 after several years of working with notable photography galleries, including Frankel Gallery, Howard Greenberg Gallery, and Yancey Richardson Gallery. He's taught at ICP and Parsons School of Design and is currently on the faculty of the School of Visual Arts. This year, he founded with Sasha Wolf the Exhibition Lab, a photography study center and critique seminar. Please join me in welcoming Michael Foley. Excellent. Thank you very much. I find Milwaukee to be a very friendly but yet a very strange place at the same time. Um, I stopped off for lunch at the Honey Pot. Anybody know this place? I got a burger with a sunny side up egg on it, on the top. <laughs> and then I come to the museum and I see a chunk of cheese on a statue. <laughs> I'm gonna share with you, just as a gallerist, some of my experiences, some of my frustrations, some of my observations of different ways that uh, work has been presented. Um, part of my responsibility is to figure out with the artist exactly how to present that work. And that doesn't mean just uh, the size of the print, what type of print, the framing, 
It also means how the work gets installed. And a lot of that is uh, very crucial. So back in the 1840s, when life was fairly simple, we had something called the daguerreotype, a sheet of copper, polished silver, in a case and a sheet of glass with a lid. You put it in your pocket and didn't have to worry too much about it. Then we move forward many, many years into the 90s when we have the artists from Germany doing large scale work, um, sometimes so large that they needed two sheets of paper to seam it together and mount it to plexiglass. I mean, if someone had told me in 1988 when I first started working that, you know, someone was going to take a photograph, put something called diasect in between that and a sheet of plastic and fuse it together and mount it and display it, I would say you're nuts. But obviously we've seen a lot of that. So I want to talk a little bit about the appropriateness of framing and presentation. This is an installation view of Paul McDonough. Uh, he was a contemporary of Gary Winogrand and other street photographers in New York uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, this is an installation view of a recent show at Sasha Wolf Gallery. Um, and you can see very traditional black and white street photography. So in keeping with that, Sasha decided to do probably the most basic type of presentation, and that was a Nielsen metal frame. I'm sure of us have, a lot of us have actually experienced framing it ourselves in a black, black metal or silver frame with a four-ply mat and a sheet of plexi. Very straightforward. It was something that was quite popular when photography was first starting to be exhibited. Um, it was a very basic type of presentation and seemed quite appropriate at the time. If you go back a little bit further, though, this was 1954 at a place called Limelight. I don't know if anybody knows this cafe uh, on 14 Barrel Street in the West Village. Uh, really was one of the first photography exhibition spaces in the country. Uh, it was a cafe in the front, and it was a uh, gallery in the back. And you, when you went to that cafe, you could see photographs of Robert Frank for $25, Imogene Cunningham for $10, and if you had a lot of money, you could buy a Weston for $50. Um, so how did Helen G., one of the first kind of gallerists, hang the work? Um, from what I can see in this photograph and what I know, a lot of the work was mounted on board or masonry. Um, and sometimes if you see Gary Winogrand photographs or Berenice Abbott photographs, they're also been mounted on masonite. It was kind of an easy substrate to actually use. It would not warp too much. It was firm. Um, and it looks like Helen, in this case, is actually just putting the mounted photograph right up against the wall. And if you look closely, her thumb is touching the front of the print. <laughs> it makes me a little sad. Um, but this probably was one of the earliest ways to kind of present the work, and you also notice the close proximity of the work as well. Um, there weren't many people buying photographs in those days. In fact, there weren't many places that were exhibiting photographs in those days. Um, fast forward a little bit, and this is when we talk about kind of proper mounting, if you will. I don't want to delve into this so much, but uh, this is a photograph by Adam Foote. It's a black and white photograph. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with Adam at one point. Um, when he was doing gelatin silver work. Um, and some of the early work was actually mounted to aluminum. Um, and because it was a silver print mounted to aluminum that needed a little bit of motion and stretch, what happened was since the aluminum didn't move and the paper wanted to move, the emulsion actually cracked on the surface. So even in this day of age, in, in day of age, in this, in this day, it's still very important and not to be taken for granted about how photographs are presented, how they're fixed, et cetera, because you have a very contemporary artist thinking they're doing the right thing, and in fact, the photograph you know, absolutely gets ruined at that point. Um, I want to share just one experience of uh, working with an artist that I had in 1992. This guy was making a comeback. Anybody know who he is? He showed up at my door. I was working at Frankel Gallery. His name is Larry Clark. Uh, only he wasn't in a suit and tie. He was in a hoodie and high tops with a box of prints under his arm, <coughs> 77 prints that looked something like this. I said, Larry, uh, how are we going to hang this? Because at the time, I actually was a uh, preparator at Frankel Gallery. And um, so he holds out these. Uh, and this was Larry's form of, uh, of uh, presentation. We actually hung 77 gelatin silver prints directly on the wall. Um, and as a gallerist, there are three things that are important. One is the longevity of the print, the actual quality. What is it printed on? Uh, secondly, it's the type of framing or presentation. Uh, and 